everybody. So welcome to uh, session P3B. Uh, so the second iteration of this action, this session, um, a novel machine learning approaches. And uh, my name is Martha Larson, and I'm happy to be your, se your session chair uh, today. Uh, now, I think that this is automatic for people by this time, but just let me remind you um, to ask questions in this session. Um, you need to get into the WOVA agenda entry for the specific presentation. And there you'll see the question uh, queue and you can put your questions there. So we're looking forward to having a lot of great questions during this session, but just remember to put them into the, um, get into that agenda entry first and put the questions there. Uh, and um, our student volunteers are here. We have, we, we're very appreciative. They'll help us with managing the questions. And then at the end of the talks, I'll ask the questions. So um, we're gonna have a tight schedule. So probably won't get to all of the questions, but um, speakers are available to follow up with you um, afterwards. So um, let's get started. Uh, so the first speaker today is going to be Pan Lee. And he's going to be telling us about PERS, the Personalized Unexpected Recommender System for Improving User Satisfaction. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. I'm Pan Li. I'm a fourth year PhD student at New York University Stern School of Business. And this is a joint work between New York University and Alibaba. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to present you with a novel recommender system that will really incorporate the idea of unexpectedness. So what is unexpectedness and why do we need unexpectedness? And here's an example. Imagine you buy a briefcase online and when you made your purchase, suddenly all of the recommendations you got will be another type of briefcases. But in that case, you don't need another briefcase at all. You probably want to have something different, something novel or something unexpected. And in another case, as we have seen in, in our uh, Kindle speech this morning, so there's this phenomenon of polarized filter bubble, and that's not ideal for the users because basically you're restricted in your own comfort zone and you cannot get ideas, opinions, or contents out, outside of your filter bubble. So to sum up, the classical collaborative filtering algorithms, which, which is similarity-based, they often lead to the problem of over-specialization, filter bubbles, and user boredom. Well, on expected recommender system, they really aim to provide novel and satisfying recommendations to the target users at the same time. So how do we do that? To start with, we need a definition for unexpectedness. And here we take a latent space definition. So our modeling of unexpectedness is the distance between the newly recommended item to the past history of the users, as we suggested, to the closure of the user interest in the latent space. So how do we model the user interest? That's actually a key of our definition. So in our last year's research paper, we proposed to model the user interest at the aggregation of all previous uh, purchases. And here in this year's research paper, we propose to model user interest as a cluster of all the past, his, past history purchases. And why that? So here's a visualization of the user, his, user interest in the latent space. And the red points that represented the user's past transactions. And if we model the user interest as one single latent closure, it might be too big. It might cover lots of space and it might unnecessarily uh, take a huge space of the latent area. But if we take a cluster of the user interest, we can really identify the user's different interests. And by doing so, we can more efficiently model the user interest and lead to a better computation of the unexpectedness measure. And going back to the definition, there's one point I want to make here. So the unexpectedness is very different from the diversity. Diversity basically measures the similarities across the recommendation items themselves. But unexpectedness, it really measures the distance from the recommended item to the user's past history. And that's a vast different concept from the uh, diversity. We also mentioned here, there are two important components when we're applying the idea of unexpected recommendations, which is personalization and session-based information. Why we need personalized information? Because some users, they tend to be value seekers and they're just more willing to click on new items to discover new and novel contents on the platform. But some other people, they might be old typed and they just want to stick to their own comfort zone. They don't want to switch to other different topics. And 
As such, we need to have different strategies to treat those different people separately. And there's also the importance of session-based information. For example, if the user just finished the first TV episode, we probably want to recommend the second TV episode to the user. We don't want to disturb the, dis disrupt the user with some kind of seemingly irrelevant recommendations. But if the user had been binge watching this the same TV episode over and over again in one night, we probably want to let the user have some rest and to provide the user with some novel, fresh, or unexpected recommendations. And that would really match the user satisfaction. So here's basically our utility function. So it really consists of two parts. The first part, RUI, is a standard or uh, classical modeling of the click through rate estimation. And it's really the second term that plays into the hand of unexpectedness. So the unexpected UI is the unexpectedness of item I towards user U, as we uh, described before. And this unexpected factor, which really incorporates information of personalized and session-based information. And we also highlight the importance of the activation function F here, which is the activation function. And why do we need this activation function? So as the figure two shows, our goal for the unexpected recommendation is that we, we want the recommendation to be not too similar or, and not too irrelevant at the same time. If the unexpectedness get too large, we might get totally irrelevant recommendation to the user, and that's not ideal as well. So we identify four important mathematical properties for the unexpected activ activation function, uh, which includes continuous, bounded, unimodal, and short held. And we discuss that in detail in the paper. Uh, so this is a base model. So we basically concatenate the user features, the historic behaviors, and item features and feed them into the self-attended GRU network to get the final uh, prediction of the click-through rate. And this is our unexpectedness model. So here, first we do the clustering of history behaviors and we get the user interest into several clusters. And then we compute the distance from these clusters to the item embeddings. And based on that, we get the value of the unexpectedness. And meanwhile, we concatenate the user features a window of history behaviors and item features and feed them into a self-intended multi-layer perception to get our estimation of the unexpected factor, which really models the user heterogeneous perception to the uh, unexpected recommendations. So here's our experiments. So we use three different data sets, Yelp, MovieLens, and Alibaba data set, and we can uh, time stratify five for cross-validation. And we evaluate the performance using accuracy metrics, including AUC and hit rate, and also novelty metrics, including unexpectedness and coverage. We compare with two groups of baselines, which include the unexpected recommendation and also the classical history predictions. So here's basically our results. What we observe here is that our proposed PURS model not only offer from all the baselines in terms of the unexpectedness, but also from all of them in terms of AUC and hit rate as well, which really shows that our PURS model generates recommendation that is novel and satisfying to the users at the same time. We also conduct extensive online A-B tests ranging from November to December last year, and we evaluate the performance using the business metric. So the application is a short video recommendation application. We measure the performance by video view, time spent, impression depth, and also the click through rate. And in all, four and in all these four uh, business metrics, we uh, observe significant and consistent improvements over the current production system at Alibaba. We also observe significant improvements in the unexpectedness and coverage metrics as well. And that leads to the deployment of the proposed model. So to conclude our model, we propose an industrial unexpected recommender system, which is capable of providing novel and satisfying recommendations at the same time. And we also conduct extensive offline and online A-B tests to really demonstrate the power of PURS and leading to its industrial deployment at Alibaba. And that's all for the talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for the talk. So we have some questions coming in here on the chat. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, one that, that, that talks a little bit about the, the, the framing and the overall problem. And this is a question asked by um, Ala Slaiti, um, who's asking, 
Uh, when you talk about unexpected recommender, are you talking about serendipity novelty or something else? Because I noticed you were using serendipity as a baseline. Okay, but let me let me stick with this question. Um, so what is the relationship between your definition of unexpected and something like serendipity or, or novelty? Yeah, so I think that's a very, very good question. Uh, so in our paper, our model of unexpectedness really is the distance. And so the distance between the new recommended items to the past uh, user behaviors. Uh, I have I definitely noticed there are several similar notations as well. For example, serendipity, uh, diversity, novelty. So serendipity, in our understanding, basically model the user's emotional response to the novel recommendations. So in other terms, if you want to measure serendipity correctly, you probably need questionnaires. And there are several literatures on that. So we basically send out questionnaires to the users and we observe the uh, feedback to the novel recommendations to the novel recommendations and we basically ask them questions, how do you feel about recommendation? Is it new to you? Is it now to you? And so on. So if you are interested in the difference in between these concepts, we have a test paper just published this year, which we provide a comprehensive comparison between the metrics of uh, diversity, serendipity, unexpectedness, and novelty. And I'm suggesting you check it out. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, we have another question here. Um, somebody is asking, uh, this is uh, um, Chang Chen, is asking, what is your method to identify the users who tend to be variety seekers? How do you, how do you identify variety seekers? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I'm, I need to go back to my slides. Um, so here, this is our basically our unexpectedness model. So what we do here is that we use an unsupervised way to identify the variety seekers. How do we do that? So we basically feed the user features, the history behaviors, and the item features all together and feed them into the self-attentive multi-layer perception to get the unexpectedness factor. So if the user is indeed a variety seeker, this unexpectedness, this unexpectedness factor should be large because we have the history, uh, we have the history log. And we train the model on the history log. And based on that, we can identify whether the user is a variety seeker or not. And so that's basically our way to do it. Okay, um, thanks. Um, I'm speaking of unexpectedness, I'm gonna choose some answers or some questions that, that sort of cover the space. Of course, um, all these are going to be there. And I think that Pan Lee will also come into the WOVA and answer um, some of them, uh, but uh, let's uh, let's ask this question. Um, <clears throat> from from Bob, from Bob Felder, um, given the increase in direct metrics of success, wouldn't you also expect sequential recommenders to learn this um, uh, this unexpectedness implicitly? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So here is the unexpectedness is uh, some, somewhat incorporated into the model in a non-natural way. And we are definitely looking for a more natural way to explicitly learn the unexpectedness through the sequential modeling. So a potential methods could be using bandits or using some other methods. And it is an ongoing project. So I think there are definitely like lots of opportunities to work into that field. But yeah, that's definitely something interesting and something we are actively working on right now. Uh, okay, and then coming back for a final question um, from uh, Benjamin Locker. Um, how do you tune the unexpectedness activation function to make sure your system's recommendations aren't too not relevant? Uh, yeah. So going back to this unexpectedness activation function. So the key here is that we need to select a proper threshold and we want to align the recommendations. So we basically don't want the recommendation to be too irrelevant and also not too far and, and also not too similar from the previous recommendations. So the so you can see the activation function here, this S times uh, exponential or minus S. So there's actually a temperature here. There's a hyperparameter of temp temperature, which really um, controls how far you want, you want this uh, unexpectedness activation function to go. And this is something you can get using the standard hyperparameter optimization methods. And you can train a model based on the historic transaction to get this hyperparameter value. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. 
Thank so you. we're going to move on now to the next speaker. So we have Hong Yang Tang um, from Tencent, uh, who we are looking forward to welcoming next. So now remember that to ask questions, you need to now move um, to the next agenda item um, in order to be able to do, to do that. Uh, so please ask your questions. Um, we're going to hear now about a progressive layered extraction. Please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, you you can uh, yeah. you can uh, speak up and lean forward. <laughs> We're looking forward to your talk. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Hong Yan Tang. I'm working at Tencent China. Today, I'm going to introduce our work, Progressive Layer Extraction, a novel multitask learning model for personalized recommendations. Uh, sorry, wait a moment, please. Can you see it now? Okay. Okay, so let's move on. Nowadays, personalized recommendation plays a crucial role in online applications. Recommender systems generate recommendation sets to maximize user satisfaction. However, user satisfaction is normally hard to tackle directly due to the high dimensionality. Meanwhile, there are many use actions reflecting user interests in recommender systems, such as click, like, share, subscribe, and so on. These actions are factors of user satisfaction and are either to learn directly. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in recent years, applying multitask learning to learn various use actions jointly, then fusing together for final ranking has been the mainstream approach in practice. So let's first look at some common multitask learning structures. Hard permit sharing is the most basic structure. As we can see in the figure, different tasks share the same bottom layers. So hard permit sharing may suffer from performance degeneration when tasks are conflicted. To deal with task conflicts, cross-stitch network and SNARS network both propose to learn ways of linear combinations to fuse representations from different tasks. However, Fusion weights in cross stitch and SNARS network are static for all samples, which could not handle sample dependent correlations. Then in 2018, Google proposed MOE that shares some experts at the bottom and combines experts with different gates for different tasks. The gate structure calculates fusion weights based on the input. So MOE achieves adaptive fusion for different samples. However, MOE treats experts equally among all tasks without task-specific experts. So it could not capture complex correlations and may bring harmful noise to some tasks. In real-world applications, task correlations are often complicated, leading to performance degeneration known as negative transfer. We also found that when the correlation is even more complex, there could be a seesaw phenomenon that we often improve some tasks at the price of others while trying different multitask learning models. This figure shows the seesaw phenomenon in a complex task groups group of VTR and VCR intense news video recommender system. VTR and VCR are two tasks to predict the probability of valid view and the completion ratio respectively. The correlation between them is complex due to their couple definition and the complex scenario of autoplay and click play. In this figure, the single task model is located at the intersection point. Models closer to upper right performs better. We can see that mm -hmm. no one model lies in the first quadrant completely. In other words, improving VCR or VTR often deteriorates the other task. In addition to VCR and VTR, there are many complex task groups in recommender systems as human behaviors are subtle and complex. Therefore, it is critical to design a more powerful and efficient model to handle complex correlations and eliminate the challenges of phenomena. So we first introduced a customized gate control model called CGC. CGC separates task specific and shared experts explicitly. The, the blue boxes in this figure are shared experts. They are intended for learning sharing patterns. The green and red ones are task specific experts to learn task specific patterns. In CGC, each tower network combines experts and its 
own task-specific experts through a gating network. Thus, the parameters of task-specific experts are only affected by the corresponding task. As shown in the figure, uh, the gating network is based on a single layer feedforward network with softmax as the activation function input as the selector to calculate the rich sum of the selected vectors. Through explicit parameter separation and customized connections, CGC enables different types of experts to concentrate on learning different knowledge. Essentially, multitask learning models needs to solve the problem of joint representation learning and routing. So we further generalize CGC to progressive layered extraction model called PLE. As shown in the figure, there are multi-level extraction networks in PLE to extract and combine deeper representations for generalization. In each extraction network, besides gates for task-specific experts, there is also gate for shared experts to combine all experts in this layer. So we can see that PLE adopts a progressive separation routine to absorb information from all lower level experts, extract higher level shared knowledge and distribute to specific tower layers progressively. Which means that parameters of different tasks in PLE are not fully separated in the early layers as CGC, but are separated progressively in upper layers. This design is a good analogy of the chemical extraction process, which can achieve more efficient and flexible joint learning and sharing. To see how CGC and PLE learn task-specific parameters, we compare them with MMOE on expert differentiation. We also extend MMOE to a multi-layer MMOE by adding multi-level experts and gates. So in the figure, uh, the width of each bar on the gates is in proportion to the average gate weight of the same color connection. By comparing these bars, we can see that P VTR and VCR combine experts with significantly different weights in CGC and PLE, while much similar weights in MMOE and the much layer MMOE, which indicates that the structure of CGC and PLE enables expert differentiation. Furthermore, there is no zero weight for all experts in MMOE and multi-layer MMOE, which shows that it is hard for them to converge to the structure of CGC and PLE without prior knowledge in practice, despite the theoretical possibility. Finally, we can also notice that the higher layer shared experts in PLE still have bigger impact on tower layers, especially for the VTR task, rather than in multi-layer MMOE. This shows the mixed demands of separating information and sharing deeper representations in multitask learning. Thus, it is not simply added to be shared or task specific. That's why a progressive fashion fits better. For evaluation, we sampled about 1 billion samples from our video recommender system. In addition to VTR and VCR, CTR, SHR, and CMR are other three classification tasks in the data set. Besides AOC and MSE, we define metric of MTL gain as performance improvements of the multitask learning model compared with the single task model. It is worth noting that 1,000 MTL gain normally contributes significant online improvements in recommender systems and, and is practically significant. This table shows the results on VDR and VCR. Due to the complex correlation between these two tasks, we observe a clear seesaw phenomenon with the, with the zig zigzag shaded negative MTL gains. As we can see at the bottom line, our PLE model achieves a double positive MTL gain and significantly outperforms other models and the single task model as well. Therefore, PLE eliminates negative transfer and seesaw phenomena successfully. We then further evaluate PLE on a task group of CDI and VCR with normal correlation. As you can see from the table, there is no seesaw phenomena. In this scenario, CGC and PLE still significantly outperform all state-of-the-art models on both tasks, which verifies that the benefit of CGC and PLE is generic, improving tasks of both complex and regular correlations. This table shows the results of online A-B testing in our video recommender system. We can see that PLE achieves 
significant increase in total watch time and the total view counts of all baseline models. From the results of more challenging scenarios with multiple tasks in this table, CGC and PLE achieve significant improvements over the single task model nearly on all tasks of all task groups, which shows the consistent improvements of CGC and PLE across different sizes of task groups. Then we try some public data sets. The left is, is the synthetic data in different correlations, and the right are census income and early CCP. We can see that PLE consistently performs best for both tasks across different correlations and different applications. So in conclusion, we propose a PLE model that separates shared and task-specific experts explicit, introduces multi-level customized connections with a novel progressive separation routine. Extensive experiments show that PLE outperforms state-of-the-art multitask learning models, eliminates the ch challenging negative transfer and CISO phenomena across different task correlations, task group sizes, and applications. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for the for the talk. Um, now we're going to go to questions. So let's kick off with uh, uh, just a really uh, you know a nice uh, background question here. Uh, and um, we have somebody asking you to, could you just give us a little more insight into the, the notion of experts that's used, uh, used here and in multitask learning as opposed to other notions of experts that people might be thinking about? What is an expert in this context? Yes, experts is, is a, 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 a network, it's a, it's a sub-network. Um, so uh, sometimes it, it can be a, just a um, single layer network or um, multi-layer network. So it is uh, yeah, MMOE, this split, splits all networks to some, um, to multiple experts to, uh, to learn different knowledge for different experts, then combine, combine all experts together. Um, for, and uh, and uh, send it to the tower layers. So uh, I think the expert is actually a, a network, it's a sub network. Yes, it can be a DNA yes. network or, or RNA network. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to go to another question uh, from, from Bob Felda here. Uh, so what role did correlation between output values play in the success of the model? Would it work better or worse with uncorrelated targets? Uh, yes, it's a good question. Uh, the correlation between, between, between tasks, uh, actually um, these, two, these two tasks, VTR and VCR, they are complex correlated. So these two tax, tasks actually challenged us and gave us a, an opportunity to discover the novel uh, and powerful network PLE uh, to improve performance significantly. And, uh, and we can see in, uh, in the experiments with the normal correlation task, uh, PLE also uh, perf perform, outperforms other baseline models Yes, so actually this complex correlation, correlated tasks uh, challenged us and gave us an opportunity to discover the, the novel network. Okay, great, thanks. Let's, let's slip in one final question here because we have somebody that's asking about an aspect which was also um, asked about in the, in the previous uh, edition of this, uh, this session. This is uh, Mariano Semmelman who's asking, who's saying thank you for the presentation. And how many parameters the model have? How much data are you using to train them? People are generally interested about the, um, about the complexity and the training inference times uh, scale of, of things here. Could you say a few words? Uh, yes. Um, the parameters of PLE model is actually can be 
uh, is this uh, is equal to the MOE mo model? Yes, uh, because the the number of experts is a hyperparameter, and we can choose the hyperparameter to find the best results. So MMO, uh, PLE actually do, do not increase hyper, increase parameters uh, of MMOE. Yes. Um, uh, uh, the training date in, in the in the experiment is about one billion samples in in, in the in the experiment, and we use the uh, they are total, they are used logs in in eight eight days. So we used the first seven days uh, data to for training, and the last last one day data for testing. Yes, about yes. one billion. Thanks a lot. So uh, thank you. And, and we're going to move now to the next speaker of the session. Uh, and we have Dangyang Lu from University of Science and Technology of China. And uh, we'll be hearing about CRED, the Knowledge Aware Document Representations for News Recommendation. Um, so then, uh, let's see oh. if we could have um, Hang Yang Tang to unshare the slides. And then um, Zhang Yang Lu starts the sharing. Uh, Hello, can... can you hear me and see my screen? Um, Hello. Yes, uh, if you could, if you could go on um, uh, full screen, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it looks you... good, and and maybe speak up just a bit according to my my microphone. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes. OK, OK, thanks. Hi, I'm Danyang Liu from University of Science and Technology of China and Microsoft Research Asia. I'm very glad to present our work called Knowledge Aware Document Representation for News Implementations with you. Uh, here is the outline of, of my presentation. Uh, at the era of internet, the volume of articles can be overwhelming to users. So it is important to offer high quality news condition service. Uh, news articles are highly condensed and uh, contains a lot of knowledge entities. These entities often serve as keywords in the news article. So with the help of the knowledge graph, we can have a better understanding of news article. Meanwhile, different entities carry different information that show different importance in the news article. How to leverage these knowledge entities is not a trivial problem. Uh, different from the traditional recommender systems, news expires soon. So ID-based methods like a collaborative filtering is not a work under this situation. So, uh, uh, so for news recommendation, we need to understand the news content. Uh, recently, many pre-trained language model have, has been proposed, uh, like BERT and Ernie. This uh, pre-trained pre language model trained on a very large corpus and can offer a good understanding of the news contents. Uh, previous models like DKN rely on the uh, specific model structure and cannot combine knowledge entities and uh, pre-trained document embedding together. So it is necessary to combine the uh, news uh, pre-trained language model with the knowledge entity. And, and the news uh, recommendation service in application not only include user to item recommendation, we also have uh, other news recommendation tasks like, like item to item recommendation, news category classification, news popularity prediction, and the local news detection tasks. These news uh, recommendation tasks are related and can share some information between tasks by entity. So it is necessary to bring these uh, tasks uh, to training together. Uh, here is the overview of our proposed model. Our model mainly uh, contains of two parts. Uh, the representation enhanced part is the left part, and the multitask learning part is the right part of the uh, figure. I will introduce them in detail. Uh, uh, our representation enhanced part contain, contains our three layers. The first layer is a knowledge enhanced layer. Uh, inspired by the knowledge graph attention model, uh, 
uh, they, in this layer, we are not only consider the entity in the news itself, but also the neighborhoods of the entity in the knowledge graph. We use the transient method to train the embeddings of the entities and the relations in the knowledge graph. Uh, the second layer is a context embedding layer. We observe that an entity may appear in the different uh, documents in various ways, such as the position, frequency, and uh, the type. Uh, so we designed this, uh, the three context embedding features to include the dynamic uh, features of the entity. Uh, the third layer is the information distillation layer. The final importance of, of an entity is not only determined by its own message, but, but also influenced by the other entities in the, in the article and the topic of the article. So we use a, a, an alternative atten mechanism to, to model, uh, to merge all the entities information into one output uh, vector. So we follow the, uh, the technique in the uh, transformer uh, query key and value uh, in this layer. layer. Uh, the second part of the model is a multitask learning model. We found that these tasks share some knowledge patterns and their data can be uh, complement each other. So we design a multitask learning approach to train the CRED model. In the multitask framework, all the a task sh uh, shares the backbone model, but on the top of the CRED model, they include some uh, task specific layers as the predictors. Uh, uh, here we come to our uh, experiment part. Uh, this is the data set we use. Uh, our data set is, comes, uh, comes from the Microsoft News, and the, the, we use the Microsoft uh, Satori as a, a knowledge graph. And we also publish the uh, large scale of the news data set um, named MAN. Uh, this, this data set is published after uh, this work. So uh, if you are interested in news recognition, welcome to use our published data set. Uh, here, uh, we compared with the three groups of the baseline methods. Uh, the first group is the traditional recommender, uh, recommendation methods, including uh, FM, uh, wide and deep, and a, a state of art news recommendation model named the NAMO. The second group is a knowledge uh, aware the, uh, recommendation methods, uh, including DKN, STCKA, and ERNI. The third group is the uh, variances of the CRED model. We use the two kinds of face embeddings, LDA plus the DSSM and the BORT. We want to study the importance of the, uh, the, of the way we to injecting the knowledge information. To uh, uh, the DV means that we do not use the knowledge entity. We only use the pre-trained uh, embedding. And the DV plus entity means we combine the DV and the entity using a tension pooling, a attentive pooling. Acquired single task means we train the task in a single task model. Uh, here is the result, uh, experiment results of uh, user to item recommendation tasks. The results show that the knowledge entities are indeed very important in news recommendation. This can be verified from the both uh, LDA plus the DSM and the board. DV plus entity are better than DV. And uh, our acquired model, computer improved the DV plus entity by, uh, which means our model can fuse the knowledge entity in a better way. Uh, here is the experiment the results of the other four new recognition tasks. Uh, we can observe the very similar results of uh, the user to item task. And we did a ablation study of the three layers in the query. We removed uh, one layer each time and test if the performance is dropped. Here is the result uh, that we can we can see that we uh, with the uh, that, that we removing the one layer with, will cause a significant performance drop, which indicates that all layers are necessary in our model. And we compare the time cost of the training and the inferring of the our 
acquired model with the uh, STCK and the KN module in DKN. Uh, unlike KCN and uh, STCKN, which model the whole text content, acquired takes the uh, aggregated information of entities as the additional input. So it is much faster in uh, both training and inference. Uh, to better understand the quality of document uh, representation, we conducted a visualization study on document embeddings. Uh, the figure is here, where each point uh, represents a document, and the, uh, the new documents are donated with the different colors based on their categories. We can observe that the document with the same category tend to uh, cluster together as the embedding but, uh, Conducted by the credit model uh, have a better distribution than the board and the LDA. Uh, we also offer, uh, provide a case study on what attention score of the credit model will assign to different entities and show uh, a same entity will take the different important scores in different uh, news articles. Uh, we select uh, two uh, news articles uh, and uh, here, which shares some common entities. and. Uh, uh, you can see in the uh, case study that uh, uh, some the shared uh, the common entities in the articles will have different uh, important scores in the two articles and uh, within the uh, uh, news article the important score is uh, also different. Uh, in conclusion, we propose the acquired model which can enhance the uh, the reputation of news uh, uh, with the entity information and. Uh, we have uh, three uh, key components in the uh, credit model, which uh, are the entity representation layer, the content con context embedding layer, and the information distillation layer. And uh, we uh, study the five key uh, applications for new recommendation and propose a multitask learning framework. Uh, and we open source our code at here. Uh, for the future, we want to, to study how to use a knowledge graph to enhance the user representation. And uh, we also want to use a knowledge graph to do the reasoning user recommendation. Uh, so this is my talk, thanks. Hello. Hi. I think we have a slight um, issue with this with the sound uh, there. Uh, let's go to let's go to some questions now. Okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, there was a question about uh, the interest in uh, the performance of the CRED model related to the entity coverage within the data. Um, let's see. I need to get to the exact phrasing of that question again. Um, so, um, did you check how entity coverage impacted model performance? And how does uh, CRED deal with uh, entities that are new and may not be in the knowledge base? Uh, actually, actually, the news is uh, different uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the, the normal uh, NLP document. Since the news is highly condensed and usually contains many entities, so the news data set is especially very suitable for to using the knowledge graph. And I remember each news article contains about more than twenty knowledge entities. And as for the new entities, actually. Uh, or Microsoft Satori is very large and uh, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, is a uh, very few uh, entities uh, is uh, new and not in the Microsoft Satori. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. So there was somebody who's now curious about um, the multitask learning. Can you explain why MTL works so well with so many tasks in your case? while it is not always the case in general. Um, uh, uh, this is Shi Wang who asked that question. Okay. Why did MTL work so well? 
Okay, uh, actually, uh, different uh, tasks uh, carries uh, different uh, uh, information. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in the new uh, user to item uh, recommendation, we don't have the local news information actually, and uh, the news category. And uh, so if we train the tasks in a multitask uh, manner, uh, they will help each other to train a better model. And uh, actually we have many data in the uh, user to item tasks. And uh, but for the uh, news classification tasks, uh, since the, we don't have so many news, so uh, the model will not be well trained uh, as a single task. So the multitask will help each other. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, just to add that if you are interested in news uh, recommendation, and we also saw a, a data set um, uh, being uh, uh, yeah, promoted yes, yes. here, there's, there's a social um, on Friday that is going to be about news recommendations. So that might be interesting to check out. Okay. Uh, okay. So thank you. And uh, if you could unshare and we'll, we'll move to our next speaker. Um, okay, okay, thank you very much. And we're very um, we're happy to introduce um, Jing Lin from Shenzhen University, uh, who will be talking about FISA, fusing item similarity models with self-attention networks for sequential recommendation. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jing Lin. I'm a postgraduate from Shenzhen University. In this presentation, I'm going to introduce our work, FISA, Fusing item similarity models with self-attention networks for sequential recommendation. In this paper, we focus on two issues for sequential recommendation. Firstly, we notice that as deep learning based methods being widely adopted to model local and dynamic preferences beneath users' behavior sequences, modeling of users' global and static preferences tend to be underestimated. Secondly, most existing methods hold an assumption that users' intention can be fully captured by considering the historical behaviors, while neglect the possible uncertainty of users' intention in reality, which may be influenced by the appearance of the candidate items. To solve these two issues, we propose a novel solution named FISA, which contains three main components, a local representation learning module, a global representation learning module, and a gating module to balance these two kinds of representations. Our FISA not only joins the effective global representation learning to the well-established SAS rec model, but also balance a user's short-term and long-term interest for each candidate item. Empirical studies shows that our FISA achieves state-of-the-art performance and surpasses SAS rec by about 10% on average. Here are some the most related work of ours, include some general recommendation methods and some sequential recommendation methods. The problem we study can be formalized as shown here. We know the records of each user as an item sequence. Then we predict the real interact next interactive items for each user. Now let me introduce our FISA with more details. The network architecture of our proposed FISA is shown in this figure. We can see that the local representation learning module and the global representation learning module share the same embedding matrix of the input sequence. Then the local representation and global representation learned by these two former module are weighted by the gating module to form the final representation. First of all, we fix the input sequence of each user by extracting his latest L behaviors. Then we can represent the input sequence as an embedding matrix of size L multiplied D, where each ve row vector is a learnable item embedding. For local representation learning, we follow SAS rec to use a self-attention network consists of a series of stacked self-attention blocks. Note that in the self-attention layer in the self-attention blocks, we adopt the causality mask to preserve the transitions from previous steps only. 
In this module, we'll take the output vector XL from the top self-attention blocks as the local representation at the L steps. Then, we notice that the local representation still ignores the variable ordering of the current item and its subsequent items. Inspired by this, we generate a global and non-causal representation of each user's behavior sequence, as FISOM does. In FISOM, sequences with similar items tend to have similar representations. We believe that this effect can be enhanced if more representative items are noticed. So instead of an aggregation with average weighting, we introduce a learnable query vector shared by all sequences to obtain our global representation learning module as the location-based attention layer as shown here. Note that different from the local representation learning module, the position information and the causality constraint are abandoned here. It's also worth mentioning that in our global representation learning module, a dropout layer is very important during training to generalize the global representation to all steps. In this way, we propose an alternative version of FISM for global representation learning in sequential recommendation. To combine the local representation and the global representation, we choose a summation operation based on our early attempts. As mentioned earlier, existing approaches of combination are still based on the historical information only, which may be idealistic because user's intention can be uncertain. And we think that a proper way to tell whether a new item can attract a user is to consider how it can arouse different parts of the user's intention. For example, the short-term part or the long-term part. Inspired by NICE, we propose an item similarity gating model to solve these two questions. The, the item similarity gating module calculates the weights of the global representation and global representation by modeling the item similarity between the candidate item and the recently interacted item, as well as the item similarity between the candidate item and the aggregation of the historical items. Here's the item similarity gating function, which outputs a gating value restricted from zero to one to represent the, the importance of the local representation. Then the final representation of the sequence at the L step is obtained by the weighted star. Special cases. Uh -huh. Then, at last, we predict the we predict the preference of item I being the L plus one items in the sequence as the vector products between the final representation and the candidate item embedding. We train our FISA by minimizing the binary cross entropy laws. In the experiment section, we, re we study four research questions as follows. To study these questions, we adopt five public data sets and delete one up evaluation. We evaluate the recommendation performance via record at 10 and NDCG at 10. Our baselines include four matrix factorization based method and four deep learning based methods. Note that SAS track here also works as the local representation learning module in our FISA. Here's are some implementation details in our work. The overall result is shown in this table. We can see that our FISA achieves the best performance on all the five later sets compared with all the baselines, which clearly demonstrated the superiority of our proposed model. Here's are some other observations. We also carried out an ablation study. We can see that the hybrid models always outperforms the separated ones and our item similarity gating 
further improve the results but to obtain the best performance in most cases. This shows the complementary effect between the local and global representations in our FISA and the better effectiveness of our item similarity gating for balancing the local and global representation. For quantitative study, we turn the latent dimensionality and the number of self-attention blocks. We also study the non-causality design of the global representation. We, we find that the causality consideration for global representation learning becomes redundant for the hybrid model. This also demonstrates the advantage of introducing the future information for global representation in our FISA. At last, we adjust the input and output of the gating function. Based on the result, we suggest to keep both kinds of historical representation as inputs for universality. And for output, we suggest an individual level gating because the feature level gating may bring instability. Here's the summer summary of our work. We propose a novel solution named FISA by designing an attentive version of FISA for global representation learning and a gating network to balance the lo local and global representations according to the items, the candidate item. And we carried out some interesting study about our FISA. Here's the direction of our future work. Thank you for listening. Um, hello. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the talk. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I want to encourage some questions to come in on the session Q&A. Remember, you need to be into, in the agenda item uh, for this talk, for the FISA talk, in order to ask a question of the speaker. Uh, okay, so... Um, Let's let's take up some um, some of the discussion points that emerged uh, in the previous uh, uh, edition or iteration of this uh, this this session. Uh, so people were interested in baselines. Uh, do you did you cover um, all the interesting baselines, or what other baselines could possibly shed uh, more light on, uh, on on what FISA can achieve? Uh, oh. About the baseline, we choose uh, four matrix factorization based methods, including FISM, uh, what is um, um, our, one of our most related work for general recommendation. Then uh, we choose four deep learning based methods, including SASREC and a new model named CAR, C -A -R, for, uh, from Wisdom 2020. And in this model, it's also a improved mod method of SASREC. And it also uh, but it's focused on the item list continuation problem. Uh, it has some similar uh, thoughts with us and as and it also um, also try to combine the local representation and global representation. Uh, so we compare it and, and we pick up the uh, consistency aware gating and carried out some ablation study here. Uh, the C here means the uh, consistent aware gating we pick up from car and we uh, carry out and, and we show some results here. We can see that our item similarity gating is better than the consistent aware gating. And yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe uh, backing off to the larger picture, uh, we have um, Rashid Jain who's asking, uh, could you give an intuitive uh, explanation for the, uh, the global and local similarity? Local and global similarity. Yeah, how would you um, explain that intuitively? Or sorry, the global and local representations. How would um, you how would you just explain the, the global and local representations 
at an intuitive level. Oh, okay. Uh, the local representation here means uh, it captures more sequential pattern, uh, including the uh, transitions from previous item to next items. And the global representation is more like a use users uh users preference users overall preference uh it contains all the items the users interacted and the local representation only consider uh some items uh and interacted by the user in short term and this is my answer Okay, um, thank you. So uh, please uh, do have a look at this uh, session Q&A afterwards because we did not have time now to get to all of the, the questions, but I would like to move on now to okay. um, the, the next talk. So thanks a lot. Um, oh, thank you. And um, uh, so we're going to now to move to um, uh, Philippe Ferreira, who's going to um, be telling us about um, global play and investigating uh, multimodal features for video recommendations at global play. Okay, and maybe I just also mentioned that um, uh, Philippe is coming to us live from Rio now. Uh, so for those of you who I think that's a lot of us who are missing uh, being being in Brazil at the moment, um, he's actually he's actually there and he's going to um, tell us about uh, about global play. So uh, uh, please, Felipe. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Felipe Ferreira. And currently, I'm a machine learning specialist at Global and PhD student at Pukki Hill. In this talk, I'm going to explain shortly about our preliminary results we obtained in investigating multimodal features for video recommendations at Global Play. This is a joint work with Daniel Souza, Igor Moura, Matheus Barbieri, and my advisor, Professor Elio Lopes. In addition, we would like to thank all the people involved who have contributed to this work in any way especially our recommendation team and our UX team. Now talking briefly about Global Group. Our company is the largest Latin American media company with the most popular news portal in Brazil. One of our main products is Global Play. We are leaders in audience and one of the main technology company in our country. Our main offices is in Rio de Janeiro. Other offices are in Porto Alegre, Sao Paulo and Recife. We have more than 100 million unique users per month. It's equivalent to 85% of internet users in Brazil. So in content, we are leaders in Brazil. Before we move on, I'd like to introduce Global Play. Global Play is Global's digital streaming platform with a very diverse video content catalog, ranging from international to Brazilian productions, such as movies, series, soap operas, TV programs, and etc. Naturally, such platforms brings lots of challenges. For example, the distribution of a large and diverse content collection through the user base, help our subscribers refine the relevant content that met their expectations, and increase user engagement with product. In this context, recommendation systems plays a fundamental and strategic role in content promotions at Global Play. The main reason is because they are able to infer through artificial intelligence algorithms, such as collaborative filtering, what are the most re relevant videos for user. This approach has shown good results when both users and videos already have a consumption history and doesn't make use of any information about the content of the video itself. But on scenarios where, where new videos are uploaded daily to the platform, alongside an expanded user base, Approach like collaborative filtering fails to, to establish recommendations due to the lack of consumption history of both new users and videos. We identified it as a business problem that our video content-based algorithms were not satisfactory and competitive because we had a lack of video metadata. We depended on the annotation that were manually made by the editors, which is a very expensive and time-consuming task. On the other hand, 
The raw video and all the streams associated with video files contain a rich multimodality information that can be leveraged to overcome item and user code start situations. This motivated us to start using the state-of-art machine learning algorithms to extract more sophisticated features from video content. Now talking briefly about our method. To speed up our research, we decided to start using super trained models from previous studies in the literature. As an image feature structure, we used a C3D model that trained on a Sport 1 name data set. As audio feature structure, we used a VGG model trained on Google audio set. And we proposed the following pipeline, which is composed of a video embedded structure and a recommendation generator. The first step is when a new video arrives at platform, we start to process in parallel, a key film structure, which is responsible for sampling one frame per scene and generates a frame sequence as output. And the log mail structure, which is responsible for processing the audio segment to calculate the log mail spectrogram as output. In the second step, we use the pre-trained models to extract features. The image feature structure is, is a C3G model that receives a frame sequence as input and outputs the average results of the last convolutional layer. We use this output as a video level feature representation. Following the same idea, the audio feature structure is a VGG model that receives a log mail spectrogram and extracts the last convolutional layer as an audio level feature representation. To produce an embedded representation for its video, we trained a separated five layer deep neural network with fully connected layers. This network receives the concatenation of aforementioned video and audio level representation as input for a proxy task of multi label classification to infer genre, content rating, and suitable age. After this process, we use the output of the four layer as the final video embedding representation. We obtain the final recommendations by computing the cosine similarity between these features obtained by processing video using the embedded structure. The result of cosine similarity is used to establish a rank of top and most similar videos in the collection. Now let's talk about our preliminary results and experiments. Our UX team conducted a qualitative study to gather user feedback regarding our method and to get a better understanding on the human task of describing and comparing video content. Users were recruited based in two categories, 12 expert users who have a specialized knowledge related to video content and 12 regular users who do not have a specialized knowledge. We created an interface that allowed the users to perform a few tasks to evaluate the recommendation generated by our method. For most users, our method managed to deliver satisfactory content-based recommendations, even though they questioned the delivery of some recommended videos that apparently were not similar to the base video. However, most users were interested in watching these seemingly unrelated titles. And after watching them, they, the users realized that the titles were somewhat similar after all, and they enjoyed them watching them. Here, we have some important factors we observed about user perception when comparing and describing video content characteristics. Users consider that a good content-based recommendations understand the nuances of content, such as combination of genres, subgenres, and themes. For, for example, action with superheroes or comedy with superheroes, or different moods within the same genre or theme. For example, Romances with happy ending or romance with sad ending. Information related to narrative structure help users to decide what, if it, that is an experience in which they are willing to engage at moment. Series with independent episodes or seasons are identified by the central theme that's used in the story of the episodes. Visual characteristics such as video's color, color palette were mentioned as a feature that help you to get a sense of contents and characters mood. Audio characteristics like soundtracks were mentioned as a similar factors when evaluating recommendations. In addition, we created an A-B test in production comparing the method against the most traditional TFDF similarity using subtitles. 
In general, we observed a positive lift in our, of, of our business metric related to videos when using this new content-based method. For example, for example as, you, as you can see here, we got a CTR with 16%, and user engagement with 5%, and click with play with 39%. And finally, our conclusions and future work. As a conclusion, our preliminary results suggest that multimodality features lead to good impressions in recommended items to users. Generous theme, mood, narrative structure, and visual and audio characteristics were mentioned when comparing and describing video content. And we got an interesting positive lift in our business metric related to videos when we're using this new content-based method against the more traditional TFDF approach. As future work, we are planning to explore more methods to extract audiovisual features, define best approach to combine text, audio, and video features, combine these features with other methods such as session-based, sequential-based approaches, and etc., and do more A-B tests and evaluations. So I'd like to thank you for attending my presentation. And if you have any question, or even if you are interested in more details regarding our research, please drop my message or for me or for our UX lead, Daniel Souza. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the talk. And let's dive right into some questions here. Um, so, and this also came up in the last session, people are interested in how um, the frames combine into representations. Uh, and so now we have um, Young Su. Um, uh, Young is asking how many frames per video were needed to make latent image features. Great question. I need to go back in my slides to explain better for to answer better this, this question. So in this step here, the first step is when we applied uh, a sampling uh, st strategy to reduce the amount of frame. Right in this at the moment we say the, we split the video in in in, in many uh, scenes using some simple te techniques. Apply for instance the histogram difference between frames. So we just keep only one frame per scene, which is reduced drastically the amount of the frames and, you, and constructing a, a, a sequential frames. So the, it depends on, fra on the, 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 the size of, of video. For instance, we, ha we have a video when we, we, where you have a, a, a 16 frames or even more than, like more than frames for, this, for making this, this sequence. After that, we have another uh, step that is Okay, I, I, we have a, a, a frame sequence, and this is the basic intuition in, in, a, in a high level. We have a frame sequence that are fed up to, to input to a C3D model. That's a convolution in, a, in, a, in the three dimensions. So that means that uh, the, the time is the sequence, the order of the frames that are taken in consideration. So using this, this frame sequence, the form, each video have a, a bunch of frames in you know, order, order by sequence. Uh, the, we fit this model, and after that, we get a four uh, uh, convolution layer, and I've averaged this, this convolution layer to get a, a, a vector representation with 512 positions. So at this moment, we have a, a, a more uh, one vector representation for each video. Basically, in general, that's the case when we reduce this, this amount of frames for each video. The last question is, yeah, so um, now I'm gonna, uh, so there's, there's a lot of questions. So you're gonna have to go, go back to that uh, agenda entry afterwards and, and look at those. But there's, there's one person who's asking, um, did you evaluate your method offline? And if so, how did, your, um, how did your offline metrics compare to your online? So that's Sandra Garcias who's, uh, who's asking that. And that's something that people are very often curious about. Can you say a few words to that? Um, yes. Yes, uh, it's a great question. Uh, particularly in this research, as the, is this first uh, preliminary, is the preliminary research, research, we tried to validate as fast as possible this idea to combine those uh, multimodality features. Uh, so offline, we we didn't uh, uh, an offline methodology to evaluate if, uh, for example, to to. Uh, 
uh, for reply methodology to try to uh, understand if the, the user is probably clicking this in this uh, title, we tried only to create these features and we evol evaluate in the pro in production and like, through A/B testing. But from the offline, or uh, as you can see, we, we didn't. Uh, although we didn't do this offline evaluation, we did a qualitative study that we what, what we were asking from during the uh, student student interview, the user in perception regarding this recommendation that I, I were explaining uh, earlier, that some users that identified that, okay, this makes sense that the color palette is, is, is equal, it's kind of equal, the sign track is the same, the genre is the same. So we have a, a different perspective that's uh, different from the offline evaluation, but uh, I, I believe that's, uh, is, is, is the, the way that uh, I, uh, this, this, the, this is the question, right? So, um, so the, basically we have a qualitative study and uh, online through AB test evaluation. Yeah, thanks a, thanks a lot for those insights. So now let's see um, if you could unshare and then we'll move to the final okay, speaker okay. of the session. Thank you. <laughs> and yes, thank you. Um, so moving now to the embeddings that came in from the cold. Okay, so we're, we're getting a little bit of, uh, of, of plot and, and, and James Bond stuff here. Uh, so without further ado, um, Jacopo, if you could put your, um, if you could go full screen for us. Sure. Yes, okay. Um, and you're on. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everybody, and thanks for joining um, us in this morning or evening or whatever time zone you're in. Uh, and thanks for the, to the organizer for, for setting up this uh, amazing conference. This work is a joint collaboration between industry, which is Coveo, so me and my colleague Christine, and Federico and University, which is a, um, uh, is a postdoc at Bocconi University in Italy. Um, without further ado, the uh, topic of today is product embeddings and the cold star scenario, which is a scenario that you uh, are very familiar with working with recommendation. Um, so dense recommendation, dense representation of products have been enjoying exceptional success uh, in the latest like five years, for recommendation, NLP task, uh, and all sorts of things. A representation of the uh, product tends to be very high quality for products and items for which we have a lot of interaction but tend to be less so high quality for red products. And of course, new products don't have any representation at all because they didn't, um, they didn't appear in the training set. So the question for us is how can we keep the elegance and the flexibility that's afforded by dense representation while making sure that the quality does not degrade excessively in the cold star scenarios? In particular, our focus being a multi-tenant scenario is on how we train cold embeddings at scale, meaning that we need to find something that's just that accurate, that's just that working well on the, on the semantic side of things, but it also needs to be scaled very easily. Compared to uh, many presentations we've seen today and the majority of, of people at Rexis, we, um, Coveo is not, does not own a website or does not own an e-commerce, but provides people that has an e-commerce or have a, like an, a website with recommendation which means that together with accuracy, we need really to be uh, mindful of how robust our system is because the way in which the company grows is not so much as becoming always, you know, always slightly better in something. It grows by adding new clients and expanding the network. And this is very important for what we're gonna see. Uh, if you lived under a rock in the last five years, like three minutes recap on word to vac and pot to vac so word to vac you know, nickel of 2013, how to build dense representation, low dimensional dense representation of products from sentences. prot to vac is basically the same. We actually use the same library to train it, like amazing Python uh, GenSim. You basically swap the concept of word in a sentence with product in a shopping session. So you collect anonymous shopping session of users on a target, on a target shop, and then you basically run the same optimization as word to vac and you train it with the usual skip gram model with you know, like positive pairs and negative pairs, like nothing particularly um, uh, challenging here. When a product vac model is fully trained, what happens as in, the, as in the case of Word2Vac is that similar products will appear to be closer in the embedding space. 
as you can see here in the picture, we have um, um, every dots represent a product in, in a target shop and they're color coded by sport activity. This is a sport apparel shop. So for example, violet products are the products related to running, light blue products are the products related to soccer and so on and so forth. As you can see here, prop to back, which is totally unsupervised, it just work with, uh, with shopping session. Um, achieve like a pretty good, um, uh, even, even at the naked eye, achieve a pretty good result on uh, uh, clustering the space uh, uh, in a meaningful way. When you inspect products in this space, you find, as we, as we, as we said, that the uh, quality of specific product representation tends to vary. For example, sneakers, which are very popular, tend to have nearest neighbor, which are sneakers themselves. Uh, GPS watches, which is way less popular, uh, are kind of a mixed bag of products when, when you look into the nearest neighbor in the space. So there's another GPS watch, but there's also other accessories, which you know may or may not be relevant. And again, of course, new products have no interaction at all, so they're not to be found in the vector space. So our solution for, for, to, to solve the cold start problem is that we're exploiting the quality of the popular products, meaning that we know that popular products have good representation in the Latin space. So the first thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna take for popular products only, for example, sneakers here, we're gonna go into the catalog, we're gonna extract textual metadata, we're gonna run into sentence BERT, and then basically a multi-input um, encoder. And we are gonna map this content vector um, produced by data, by textual data to the latent position in the, uh, in the space. Once we know how to map content to position in the space, we can apply the same transformation to rare or new products because rare and new products may have bad behavioral data, but of course they still have the same catalog data the popular product have. For example, GPS watch here with name, category, brand, and description, we're gonna run it through the same function and we're gonna map it into the Latin space. To test the robustness of what we're doing, because again, we're a multi-tenant SaaS provider, so we need to make sure that what we do works for a variety of uh, deployment scenarios. We tested on three shops in our uh, network of clients. Uh, they differ massively for traffic, as you know, witnessed by the Alexa rank, industry, number of SKUs, and of course, the number of sessions that are used to train the product back. The first experiment is to evaluate simply the um, quality of this representation um, using the next event prediction task. And we use a standard LSTM for that. Next event prediction task is a standard task for prot to back And it's basically asking the model to uh, giving like uh, N product in, a, in an unseen shopping session, what is the N plus one product that the user is gonna interact with. We use a very simple model, vanilla STM, because our our, our goal is to evaluate the quality of the embedding itself, not to a very complex model that makes it impossible to debug or to understand if the final performance is due to the quality of the embedding or to the complexity of the model. So our test is original behavioral only prot to vec the one we have been using before, which is you take representation of um, products, only the vectors that are produced by the prot to vec model against a mixed space. A mixed space is exactly like the behavioral one but we swap the rare products or the new one with the vectors that we learn through, uh, through the mapping function. So the popular products are the same in the two spaces, but the mixed space as rare and new products added with this trick. And of course we report in DCG as a standard metric and we report it across all of our clients. As you can see here, um, the performance for the mixed space is basically the same for the general um, uh, the general, so the general uh, uh, test set, and it's significantly higher when you focus on the rare event only. The second experiment is uh, inspired by two considerations. The first one is that a lot of time you don't really just want product embeddings to be used in recommendation directly, but you want to use them in downstream tasks. For example, conditional language model for type for type ad suggestion. Um, and the second consideration is that like interviewing with clients, uh, it's very important that the experience for the final user is consistent, meaning that even if we don't recommend the correct product, we still want to recommend something that's reasonable enough. So let's take this example. The first example is like the target, the target shoes is a, is a pair of sneakers. The prediction is another pair of sneakers. So technically this is wrong in our test set, but it's a reasonable mistake. Uh, in the second case, we have the target is a shoe, is a, sorry, is a sock. And the prediction is a pair of gloves, which is not just wrong, but very wrong. In a, in, a, in a period where bounce rates are very high, 
we want to minimize the effect, like, like puzzling the user with recommendations which are clearly off, which tend to happen for red product because again, of the, of the low quality of the representation. So to track for this, uh, this iteratum, we basically make sure to report the average cosine distance on mistakes um, when the models are wrong in the, in the next event prediction uh, task. As you can see uh, across all shop, the average cosine distance between the target uh, item and the predicted item is significantly lower, which means it's better for the mixed version of the embeddings compared to the original one. Wrapping it up, uh, so we present a scalable solution to recall the embeddings problem in, uh, uh, in e-commerce, and we benchmark its accuracy across a variety of deployment scenarios. Our solution is still enjoying the same generality of protobac generally, so it's more general than just recommendation model. It can be used in a lot of our tasks. For us, it's very important, and it does not require replacing any existing infrastructure, because for downstream system, the protobac generated by behavioral data only versus mixed data is basically the same. And of course, it builds its accuracy directly on other dense representation, meaning that if we want to add image vectors, or if tomorrow we have BERT2, which is better at encoding meaning, we can totally swap in and swap out um, uh, different representation and basically improve everything downstream without any change. As a next step, we look forward to leverage a hierarchical structure finding most catalog, which, is mean, which means exploit directly the category three that you can find in catalogs to uh, further improve the quality of our representation. Thanks so much. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and let's see, I think you already answered one of the questions about, uh, uh, apart from the textual metadata, did you also consider using the visual data? Um, that was Katrin Lanen who was asking that. Um, you pretty much answered that already, or yeah. would you like to say something else? No, I mean, I, I, we, we started, uh, so we started with, the, with textual data as we were just trying to see if this whole idea of swapping in and out uh, embedding was worth more investigation. So we didn't, but it's honestly, given the setting we, we, we came up with, I think it's a trivial, it's a trivial stuff to do, and we're surely gonna do that in the, in the future. Uh, and then uh, uh, maybe just backing off a, a little bit. So Sumat Sindana has pointed out um, just something that also came up in the, the last iterations. I mean, this this magic step where you go to the, from the text domain to the uh, the product to back embeddings. And uh, could you just like uh, repeat again uh, a little sure. bit about how that works? Uh, sure, it's, uh, it's, it's a simple, basically multi-input encoder when you basically try to project the space of the text data as previously encoded by sentence bird. There's a bunch of concatenation and projection and so on, usual stuff, you can, you can I mean, details are in the paper, but at the, end, at, the, at the end of the idea, what you do is that you project that using mean square errors as, as your loss function to the latent space directly. So at the very end, you have this projected down representation of text and you try basically to like regress it on a lower dimensional space of the uh, of the Latin space, and then you train it with you know um, uh, early uh, early stopping to prevent overfitting, and then you basically cut, basically obtain a, a function that, that gets you from the uh, five hundred and twelve I think Bert uh, Bert uh, dimension to the fifty dimension of the Latin space. And uh, how might we expect this to vary across domains? So we have Chin Bui who's asking about. <laughs> Um, recommendations for scientific articles and new articles. If, if we move domains, uh, what would you expect? Uh, so if you move domain, it means that your target is going to be the news is not going to be like a, like a pro to vec kind of vectors, right? The, the, ta the target space is probably going to be a bit more high dimensional than our, than our small uh, 48 or 50 product dimension. So the, the, the answer to this is, I don't know. Um, but it, it, may, it may be that, it, that, it's, that it's worth a try. Our, our solution is product focused for now. Okay, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. Um, now for this talk, as well as for the other talks, one more reminder, do go into that agenda item and check out the session Q&A, both for this uh, edition of the session and the last edition. Um, there's some interesting discussions that are developing there. Uh, so we've come to the end of the session. Uh, we'd like to thank um, 
thank the um, student assistants, um, thank my co-pilot who was um, Zeno for this session, uh, and uh, also a big thank you to all of the author presenters. Now, um, the next thing on the agenda, as you have noticed, is the reception. So it's time for the reception. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody there, and uh, that would be one of the many opportunities that you have to interact and, and maybe also with these authors if you didn't get your question asked during the session. So a big thank you uh, once again, and that wraps up Novel Machine Learning Approaches 1. <laughs>